His face was set like a flint. And when there was anything that was going to come and deter him from what his purpose and his vision was, to get his focus off, he could recognize what it was. Get behind me, Satan. There's some things in our lives we need to say. Get behind me, Satan. You see, you've got to know what, what, where those things are coming from. Peter was a good friend. He, he was one of Jesus' key disciples. It's those that are close to you. The things that are close to you that the devil will try to use. Now, your friend isn't the devil. Peter wasn't the devil, but the devil is, gets, gets in there. And the enemy, the Bible says that our enemy, our adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, is roaming around seeking whom he may devour. You know, the enemy's out there. When we face those distractions, those weights that are coming to try to drag us down, where do you think they're coming from? Well, a lot of people believe, well, Jesus, God is just trying to make us go through some stuff to teach us some stuff. You know, I know that we learn through these things, but we've got to know where they come from. We've got to know where they come from. The enemy is the one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. When you're going through something, don't say, Jesus, just keep making me suffer that I can just learn more and more. No, you can learn by reading the word. You can learn by receiving the word in your life and applying it. You can learn through revelation of his word. That's how he teaches us. And you can learn by putting the devil where he belongs. When you recognize those, the, 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 what is behind those distractions. So a lot of times I have to tell my wife, get behind me, Satan. No. <laughs> those that are close to you, the enemy will use. And, and of course, it's more Danette telling me, <laughs> get behind me. You know, we've got to recognize that. Four things I just want to leave with you. To try to make the scattered message kind of come together here, four things. In terms of keeping our focus, number one, we've got to recognize the enemy. It comes through things that, and people and, and, and situations that are close to the heart. But you recognize where it's coming from and you put it behind you. Secondly, as I try to wrap this up here, is keep perspective. And I, and I was going to read some. I got a few minutes. I know he said 1130. I got three minutes here. I want to read a, a, a letter I came across a few years back, and it helps you really understand the importance of perspective. If you're going to keep your focus, you have to keep things in the right perspective. When you get to places like Africa, things can get so out of hand and out of perspective, where, where minor things become major things, and, and you know a small little thing becomes a major argument. You know, all you married people know what I'm talking about. All right, this is a letter, and, it, and I'll just read it, and it's kind of self-explanatory. Dear mom and dad, this is from a daughter that's gone off to college and she's writing back and she says, Dear mom and dad, wow, life has sure taken a turn since I wrote last month. I met this really neat guy, Billy. He's going to be a singer in a new band that he and his buddies are putting together. You know how I love musicians. He tried other jobs and hasn't been successful. He feels music is his true purpose in life. He's so disciplined. In fact, he gave up drinking two months ago and hasn't drank since. His probation officer says he's doing so well that his probation period may be possibly cut by six months. I'm so proud of him. Mom, I'm so glad you taught me not to judge people by their appearance only. So when he asked me to marry him, I agreed knowing you'd understand. Because the band is just getting started and we have little cash, we decided to elope. Good news, you're going to be grandparents. Though surprised, we're excited to be expecting a baby with, with the... Those surprised were, expected, were, were excited to be expecting a baby. With the coming of our baby, I thought it best to drop out of school for the time being. Perhaps later on in life, I'll finish my pre-med education. For now, we're staying with Billy's roommates just until the band gets going. Then we'll get a place of our own. Hopefully, you'll be able to meet Billy soon. Love, Cindy. P.S. This is all untrue, but I did get a speeding ticket last night and a D in calculus. Amen. It puts it in perspective. When you're pursuing your vision, don't let the little things take your focus away. Don't let the distractions. Now, of course, when your child loses their sight, that's not a little one. But you recognize that it's from the devil. And you count it for what it is. There's a few years back, we're, we're here in the States on furlough. Yeah, probably, what, I don't know, six, seven years back when Toby was going through his thing. Toby was also born premature. Two of my three children were born premature. Toby was born two pounds. You know, I, <laughs> Trey, of course, he was almost 10 pounds. But 
When we're back in the States, he was born in South Africa, but we're back in the States, we're itinerating for a few months, and he had developed this thing about every four to six weeks, he could hardly breathe, and we had to get him on medicine. And so we go into the doctor, and the doctor begins to tell us how important our children are and that we're going to probably need to leave Africa. And, and this doctor, a Christian doctor, is trying to tell us how we should really consider our children and that, you know, this child needs special help. He's going to need therapy. He's going to need all this and this and that and that. And, you know, I'm sitting there listening to the doctor, trying to keep that smile on my face. But as soon as we got out of the, Danette and I were walking out of the, uh, the doctor's office, I said, I don't receive that report. That's not right. That's not from God. You say, well, how can you say that? They're a doctor. They have all those medical degrees. Because I know what God called me to do. I know my purpose. I got to keep a focus on that. I got to recognize where these things are coming from. That's from the devil. Now, it wasn't the doctor, but I knew the root was from the devil. Get behind. Everybody say, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Amen. Let's keep our focus. Last testimony I just want to leave with you, one of the most recent ones in our ministry in Niger, is some of y'all may, who get Danette's blog, in Sai, we planted a church, and Sai was where Islam first came to Niger. We planted a church, uh, there had been a church that was planted about five years back, and the missionaries were driven out by police, a police escort had to come and rescue them because it had gotten so out of control. That was five years ago. Uh, a year, a little over a year ago, we went and planted a church there because we had heard that the people that were creating such a, uh, uh, I mean, such an attack against Christianity had left. So we had planted our church there, and it was doing well. Every time I would go and preach there, I would begin to have a crowd, and I'd take up an altar call to receive Jesus, and people's hands would go up almost every time I preached inside. It was incredible. And so we were so excited to see, yes, God's time for Sai is now. And so we planted that church, and people begin to, and, and within, I don't know, eight months, probably about eight months, all the attack came back. And they said, and we didn't even have missionaries living there. We had sent a, a national, a Niger man, to come and lead the work. And he, but we had brought him from the Hausa tribe to work, and he was working among Zarma and Fulani people. And as he was uh, preaching, he was having great results. People were receiving it, but some of the traditional leaders were very much upset, and the Malams and the, uh, the, the, the Muslim, strong, radical Muslims. And so they began to come and attack. And so we actually had to pull our pastor back out, but we left the people in place in the church because we'd been there long enough that the church continued to meet, and we would just come in on Sundays and speak, but not live inside. Well, that got, and we did that for a little bit, and then we realized we're, we're, they're not going to have us back in, so we had to keep it like that. So we moved this pastor that they drove out. His name's Sule. And we moved him to another town, maybe about, I don't know, 20 miles, probably in terms of miles.